Well, hello, everybody. Uh, we have another chance to sit down and talk today. Uh, Terry is back again. Uh, he's been able to um, provide well for the care of his family and uh, take care of his mom a little bit. And so it's good to see him sitting in his regular chair. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, Terry and I like to sit down and talk about things that are connected to the work of an evangelist and try to do so in a practical and profitable way. Our subject for today is pretty simple. Uh, we've been talking about a lot of the interaction between evangelists, Christians, brethren at large, and the way in which not only can we do so in a healthy manner and have these sometimes difficult conversations turn to profitable outcomes, but just generally as those who are teachers engaging in a public way to be effective. And so our key focus for today is things worth saying in a worthy way. Um, I think it's really important that we understand that principle when we step up to preach, when we step up to teach, when we sit down to talk with a friend who we care about, with someone whose soul is on the edge of um, great choices. Uh, but Terry, how are you doing? Everything going all right for you? Doing great. Doing great. Good to be back. And I uh, really appreciated the discussion last week with you and Max. And I know we hope to do that again with Max in the future. And looking forward to today's discussion um, on the important things to talk about here about preaching. Right, you know, and uh, yeah, Max will be back. Um, we're working on a schedule also with uh, the potential of Steve Wolfgang joining us. Steve is an expert in restoration history. You probably not gonna like me saying that, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it. He's probably one of the most well-read individuals that I personally know on that uh, edge of uh, the combination of spirituality and its impact and religion and its impact on American culture um, through the Appalachias, Southeast, all the way up into Indiana and those interactions. Um, so look forward for that in the future. But right now, for today, let's start breaking things down. We've, we've kind of broke it up into two areas because uh, we wanted to be rebels and not use the three-point format or just because we only had two things worth saying. It's one of those two points. Uh, but What's the process that we can use to figure out, is this worth saying? And, and I'll kind of add a little caveat. Uh, we might talk about it in the sense of the pulpit, in the sense of the Bible class, in the sense of maybe a small group study, uh, or even one-on-one. -on -one. How do we determine, is this something I need to address? What motivates us and what clarifies that for us? Uh, Terry, where, do you want to start with that? I know it's a big box. Yeah, that's a big box. Um, I, I'll go back to something I was told early on. Um, when I was when I was training under Wilson Adams, I had to, I had to interview a couple a uh, preacher every week, and um, it was really interesting. One of the things that uh, was talked about in this is really in this area. I was told by one preacher, only speak on things that you're passionate about. And uh, because you'll be more effective. I was told by another preacher, literally, I think the next week, um, that he scheduled his sermons a year in advance. So he never allowed passion to creep into his sermons. <laughs> because if he was <laughs> too passionate, then it was more about serving self. And he had reasons for that. It was just very entertaining to see this. I mean, exactly opposite extremes of what I was told within basically a week to two weeks time. Um, but when you yeah. think about having something worth saying and being passionate about it, I think uh, maybe first off the the the, the passion if, if passion sometimes can be misleading. You may be passionate about saying something and it still not be worth saying. Um, I'm very passionate about Tennessee football, um, but quite frankly. There's not a lot worth talking about Tennessee football the last couple of years. Um, <laughs> I'm still passionate about it, um, but I, I'll say a whole lot less uh, than I used to. Um, and that's a silly illustration to kind of say, look, just because something's passionate doesn't mean it's worth saying. I think worth saying really has to go to a couple of factors. Obviously, number one is whether or not it's true. If something's not true, it's not worth saying. But number two, um, and I think this is where preachers have a responsibility is understanding not only if it is um, 
true, but whether it needs to be said in the specific context that you're going to be saying it in. Um, there, there's some things um, that don't need to be said, even though they may be true. And there's some things that need to be said in certain environments because they're more effective. Um, and so you have to filter all of that out. And that kind of leads down to what you're saying about, hey, there's, in fact, I heard somebody say one time, well, um, they were asked to preach on something and their response was, I don't really feel like it's appropriate for the pulpit, but that's something I'll handle in a Bible class. And yeah. they were criticized for that. And, um, and I will tell you that that is true about some things. Sometimes there are things that should be handled in a class situation instead of a pulpit situation. And, and that goes into this process that we're talking about really is understanding what's worth saying in the right environment. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some tools that I use to try to help uh, make those conversations, those sermons, those classes go better. Tool number one, I am a bit of a planner versus a reactor. So I do plan out my sermons. I do plan out themes. I do that to avoid being reactionary to repetitive cultural events. Um, if you build your sermon plan based on responding to what's in the news, you're basically participating in their marketing program. Uh, and uh, I choose not to for many reasons. Secondly, um, I think this is probably more important. You have to kind of develop the capacity of verbal modesty. And, and that is to speak about things that kind of go across the whole spectrum of the human endeavor to the appropriate level of depth to your audience, uh, which is where this, this uh, shift between sermon, class, conversation takes place. Uh, your sermon is gonna have, uh, if your assemblies are like mine, um, visitors from the community that have an unknown spiritual background, uh, members of all levels of spiritual development from the newest converts to the shepherds to uh, the sister or uh, brother in Christ who have been studying the Bible longer than I've been alive. And so I have to take that into consideration. And some subjects, I want the ability to ask a question to get a response. Once I reach that point that, that like that's necessary for my personal skills to engage the subject the best, then I'll immediately say, yeah, I want to do this in a class. Um, uh, and that's really the, the shift for me. I'm willing to preach on any topic from the pulpit, but how I address it will change based on the tools that you allow me to engage. Uh, and so some subjects, particularly aspects of uh, relationships, um, uh, difficult Bible passages, textual exegesis, um, textual criticism, um, those are harder to do in a sermon, and easier to do in a Bible class sometimes best to do on a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Um, and so that's part of this figuring out the, the passion side, um, because just because you wanna say it, doesn't mean that the, me the means to say it is to slap up on tw Twitter with a 17 you know, linked uh, breakout and say, here you go, whole world, here's my screed against whatever. And I've now satisfied because my passion has been poured out. Um, and so I think there's some principles, and we've cited one of the Bible passages that I think is really important. I'm going to drop it again right here. Uh, this is from you know, the text of Proverbs, um, and it's a, it's a really important text for us to uh, uh, kind of key into and tie into. Uh, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold uh, is a wise reprover to a listening ear. The way that I illustrate that text most of the time is to say, when a gentleman gives a, a, a young woman an engagement ring, the first thing she wants to do with that great gift is show it off to all of her friends. And it does not matter how big it is. It matters who gave it to her and what it means. So our words need to be framed in a way that once received, you're willing to share it with another person. I realize that's a high lofty goal, but I think that's the first package in determining, can I say this? And is it worth saying uh, to the folks that I care about, to the folks that are next to me? Um, I think I may have just lost Terry for the first time ever. Uh, he'll, he'll hop back in, I think, in a moment. Uh, uh, with
with us, but uh, there could be some technical difficulties there. So, you know, you, you step a little bit further into this process and you step a little farther into the discussion. Um, when you're trying to balance out the process and once you've categorized when you're going to say it, am I going to say it in a sermon? Am I going to say it in a Bible class? Am I going to say it one-on-one? -on -one? Um, am I going to say uh, this message, um, you know, maybe in a small group? You're going to take that information and then you're going to begin to say, okay, if it's going to be worth saying, then I'm going to make sure that it is explained in a way that includes what God adds into the dialogue as the foundation. Uh, because the preacher's goal is to speak as the oracles of God. You're supposed to connect well to the delivery of that testimony. Terry, it sounds like you may be back. Um, uh, did you rejoin us here? I'm trying. I will tell you that I'm on uh, my cell data now because we've the lights are going on and off at my office. So um, hopefully I can. <laughs> well, Terry uh, does live in Alabama. And so, and so maybe there's something going on that we don't know about. Uh, uh, I, I, no comment on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I am back now. So, so, so Terry, we, sh we shifted from Proverbs 23, our key text, to kind of, making sure that our foundation is built well on the worth of the message and so that we're including God's testimony in the process. Um, those are the things that are gonna be the most value in our immediate role as preachers, as teachers, because that's what we need to be doing. We're sharing the good news. We're sharing God's word. We're sharing God's message with those that we care about. Um, and we'll talk about the, the methodology of how to shift through the details and to sort off the chaff and to kind of boil the message down here in a little bit. Um, but what are some other tools that you use to distinctly separate, um, is this even worth saying at all? Uh, I think that's one thing we have to include. Uh, Jesus was so powerful with his silence um, that there are times when he would just sit there and not engage. Um, his engagement was not with him telling, but him asking. Um, that's part of the, the process to determine what do I do? Um, and there are uh, cultural shifts that take place in, and all this be really plain about that are challenging for preachers. Um, it's challenging for preachers to figure out how to address the family decision to public school or homeschool. It's challenging for preachers to address um, the various dietary plans that families kind of go through cyclically. Um, lately, it's discussions of organic food versus um, you know, multi, you know, large corporate food farms, and uh, which are just larger farms. I mean, you talk about corporate farming, that's no different than small farming. Most of those guys use the same principles to a certain degree. Monsanto and all that stuff, and uh, health food products, and gym memberships, and uh, well, my, my workout's better than your work, workout. Probably is, you know. Um, and that's part of this process too, is this, are these worthy topics for the pulpit per se? Uh, and sometimes they're not, and sometimes they might be. Terry? Well, I for one never talk about diet. Uh, that's like rule number one. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, or working out for that matter. Um, beyond... <laughs> Beyond those two ground rules that are emphatic and must always be followed by me, um, you know, uh, let me first say I think I think there's a moment of confession here um, that we we want to acknowledge. We probably at different parts of our life, and some would say maybe even today, are not good at those kind of things. Um, and I'm sure. For those of my Facebook friends, there are some of you who would look at my Facebook page today and say, I should have known when not to say things today. Um, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, as a whole, I think one of the things that I often go through is um, my overall purpose is when I share the message of the gospel is to try to not only share things that are truthful, but things that change people for the good. and help them to be disciples. And in that sense, I think I think the point of that that's really important is 
you know, the, the gospel should change your life. And if all I ever do is tell you um, that you don't need to change and everything's great, um, I'm, I'm not sure I've effectively reached you in the way. Now, there, there may be times where that's the message. But as a general rule, what, the things that we need to do need to be truthful, but they need to be life challenging, perhaps even life changing, I think. Um, now, as you said, that, that kind of gets into the differentiation of, of medium. You know, I, in, in, the, in the pulpit, I have everybody in there from the youngest that can understand the words I'm saying to the oldest that can understand the words I'm saying. And so what may be life changing on a subject still may not be appropriate in there because of the audience. Some things are more appropriate for my adult class um, because we can be more detailed and we can be more adult about those discussions. Some things are only appropriate for one-on-one. Hey, there's some things that my wife and I deal with in marriage counseling I would never say from the pulpit. Um, yeah. It's just not appropriate. Um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be said. It just has to be said in the right place. And so, you know, beyond the standard, I think, and I'm not belittling the idea that it has to be true. I just think we all, I think that's like a baseline where we all understand it's got to be true. But then where do I go for that? Um, I think it's going to be life-changing, and I think that's biblical. I think when Paul told Timothy to avoid the genealogies and wrangling with words, I think part of that is that kind of stuff doesn't change anybody for the better. That doesn't make them better disciples. And they may be biblical discussions, but that doesn't make them better disciples in that sense. Um, focus on things that really matter, and what really matters is making us better today than we were yesterday. Um, and what does that look like? And I think that's really important. So, so we, as we build kind of the structure here, the foundation then becomes, did God say it? Did God express it? Did, are we accurate in our understanding? Uh, maybe if we want to get technical, do we have the appropriate understanding of the textual issues behind it? Have we gathered enough information from the rest of the, uh, God's will to make sure that we're really encapsulating a truth that he is sharing for everybody? And then... We say when, uh, then we say um, where. Uh, that still fits into the passion side of things uh, because you want to speak uh, something worth saying to the people who need to hear it the most um, or the people who just generally need to hear it. Um, you know, I try to be uh, intentional with my use of social media for the most part. It doesn't always look that way. Uh, but I really am. I mean, there are things that I choose not to share on social media for lots of reasons. Some of the reasons are, um, you know, I talk a lot with uh, um, young folks, uh, uh, our kids too. If you're going to put something on social media, it should be people, not things. Um, you know, it should represent people for the most part. It should represent you. It should represent your friends. It should rep represent relationships. So that helps kind of guide that tool to a healthier destination, you know, across the board. Um, so in the context of preaching and teaching, I kind of still use that same model. Like, how does this affect the people who I'm interacting with? Um, how does this respond to the culture that they're coming from when I'm trying to draw them into the culture of Christ? Um, you know, that's the, the bouncing process that's taking place there. Um, and that will then also indicate to me, I've got to have a bigger picture than just this one message. Um, and that's part of my planning side. Um, yes, when I get to preach right now, because of the structure of our assemblies, my sermons kind of need to be between 29 and 31 minutes long. Uh, that's the, the, the function of, of our worship together is that we've slotted that. That means I have to fit what I want to say into that time frame. But I also know that if the Lord wills, I have next Sunday too, and the Sunday following that, and the Sunday following that. And I have to remember, brethren will remember some of what I preached last, say, last Sunday and will forget some of what I said last Sunday. And so I bring that to the table, is it worth saying? Um, I remember, um, you know, with my first sermons, we'll add this on the worth saying side as we kind of shift edges. 
um, you know, I went to college, had multiple public speaking courses, did some of the community type instruction that happens with the various speaking clubs that you can join into and participate in, like Toastmasters and stuff like that, because I wanted to get better. Uh, and that's one of the ways in which you can get better. Um, and I also read a lot of books on how to do sermon outlines. And one of the ones I read way back when was how to prepare Bible mess messages. Um, and it's got a very standardized style. Um, well, and one of the things that helps you do is ask the question, does this fit? Does this fit right here? Is it worth going that far down the rabbit hole for that detail? <clears throat> so you gotta, you gotta add that thing, kind of go through that sifting process. Let's shift the tables. Um, it doesn't matter if you have the best idea ever, like this, Subject is what brethren need to know. And if they don't know this today, they're going to be so far off of God's design for them uh, that they may never come back. Uh, if I don't say it in a way that they'll respond to, um, if I don't frame the message that's so vital in a way that will actually engage their hearts, um, then I've wasted their time and mine. And maybe I put our, all of our souls collectively at risk uh, because I did not frame a message that actually encapsulated other biblical principles on how we communicate to one another. We talk about speaking in a worthy way. It's not just about being a great communicator. That's necessary. We need to become good communicators and maybe great communicators. But that's not the, the key here. It's um, the emotive connection. It's the kindness that comes across, the zeal and the fire um, should be seen. Um, I know you've worked with some young guys. I've worked some, with some young guys. What are some of the tools that you've brought into that play and maybe what you've learned along the way to help narrow down the success path that we make a message that's worth saying and while we're saying it in a way that's worthy of the king whom we serve? Yeah. Um, again, I'm not sure that I'm always great at that. Um, so, uh, let me just say that I'm the, by no means an expert. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that I've tried to do with guys, as far as how to say something, and I've talked about this before is generally to teach them how to write first and then how to, how to write sermons later. Um, and if you can teach somebody how to write and how to think in that kind of pattern logically, but when I say that, by the way, what I mean writing from my standpoint, too, is not intellectual academic writing, but more conversational writing, which is more effective with people. If we could teach them that, then they, then they sort of understand then how to take that and verbalize it and say it in, in a more what we would call a polished way. I'll tell you one of the things that young preachers do in this area, and I did it, and probably you did it too, and still a danger to do it now. And it's going to be somewhat shocking to some people, and you may disagree with me. When I was first preaching, I thought the way to speak in a worthy way was to cram every passage on that subject I could in, into that one point. And... Um, <coughs> I was really good at what was called back then concordant sermons. The reason I say back then is nobody owns concordances anymore. I think it would be called a Google search sermon at this point. Um, but you would search every passage that remotely dealt with like baptism and you would, you would read 10 passages about baptism. And I think, I don't know that that's the worthiest way to handle scripture. Um, in an effective, polished way. You you can often say just as much with two or three passages as you can with 10, if you handle them correctly. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and I so think, that was uh, one of the major changes for me, by the way. Yeah, uh, no doubt for me. Um, you know, there's a couple of uh, crutch feelings that you can say, well, I've got all these passages that back me up. So ergo, I'm true because I really made sure that I covered any questions that I thought someone might bring up and I just laid them all out there. Um, and I remember vividly, 
um, you know, responses from sermons positively and negatively based on the bulk of the information that I shared from the text. Um, and we sometimes gauge our success level based on that feedback. Oh man, you had so much Bible in there. That was so great. Um, but all I did was basically read the scriptures, which is a, a thing. That's a good thing. Um, but the role of the preacher is give a sense to what you've read, uh, just like it was the role of the priest to give a sense to what was said. And so I've navigated intentionally to um, trying to balance those things better, uh, to be a little bit more um, uh, intentional in that process. And so for me, that really means that I'm going to have to take the time to break down um, the structure of the sermon in a healthy way to make sure that each of the passages I bring up, they're going to be the passages that are the most powerful to change a heart. And then very often I'll say, and if you want to know more, Paul talks about it here or Hebrews talks about it there, and I'll just move on from that point. I'll just go and say, you know, uh, we can talk about that at another time, in another way. Um, and uh, when that time comes up, then I unfold the whole package, and there the whole Google sermon takes out. Um, you know, included in that uh, is uh, the next kind of layer of things, is to making sure um that when you relay the message, and Terry talked earlier about the process of writing conversationally and how that builds a better uh, understanding of how to preach a sermon, because really it does. If we have a great conversation in text, it's easier to have a great conversation in the pulpit, in the Bible class, um, and that's, they're, they're tied together. Um, and I'll throw this right here, academic articles do not prepare you to preach, but they do prepare you to study. Um, and they have a place and a purpose. Um, sure. But yeah, that's that, that's one of the, the, the building blocks. The other thing I'll say, and this is a struggle for young preachers, and it becomes a crutch for older preachers, and that's life illustrations. When you're 25, you don't have any great stories. Um, you know, you might have some, but they're not great stories. When you're 55, you feel like all your stories are great. Um, uh, um, and in practicality, is probably those, both those things aren't really true. So there's a crutch that happens in the middle where young guys, I don't know if they were taught this, uh, but they appropriate, appropriate preacher stories. And they kind of insert themselves into these generic preacher stories. Let me just say, don't do that. Um, it's not genuine. Uh, everybody knows. Uh, the secret's out. Um, you know, those, those preacher type stories aren't really the method. There's other ways to introduce things that are going to create a higher value of worth. Um, secondly, um, try to understand that in your audience are people who will be upset with what you said no matter no matter when it is. Um, and so that means that you want to make sure that the offense that takes place is the appropriate offense. Um, you could be offensive because you're mean. Uh, just because you're mean doesn't mean you're doing God's work. Um, and I think that's something that um, I'll just tell you straight from my perspective. As a younger guy, zeal can be misunderstood for a negative demeanor, uh, for meanness. I don't know if Terry's been through that, but I know that on the receiving end and at times when I'm upset, it comes across in the preaching. And that's not why I intended. Um, when I, especially when I was younger, as I got older, I became more aware of it. It means it doesn't it doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but I'm more cognitive of that reality that my attitude does impact the message. Um, and I tie it this way: I remember hearing a sermon preached on the interactions of Jesus and Peter and that "Do you love me?" Uh, dialogue, and in that sermon. The guy basically screamed at me and our family in the course of his sermon so much that our young child was crying halfway through the sermon because he was so agitated sounding. I know that's not the guy's personality. I know that he wasn't upset, but the delivery was so negatively connected 
that I'm like, I'm pretty sure this guy doesn't love me, uh, even though he's trying to exhort us to love in the way that Jesus did. So that's part of the issue too, in that we have to have that high level of spiritual awareness that says each of these components matter. Uh, and by the way, don't manufacture them, don't build them, be them is a side note. So we've got, um, you know, the, the writing methodology, the audience understanding, like think about your audience, think about how they're gonna respond to it. Um, what else, Terry? Uh, we're probably gonna be cutting off here pretty soon just because I don't wanna fight against the internet anymore than we have to, but I wanna close out on some high notes. Well, uh, one of the things we didn't really talk about that probably we should have, and I meant to bring up in my disconnection issue is, is bad. Um, the one thing that we didn't talk about in, in regards to that, the thing needs to be brought up to is the avoiding of proof texting. We probably should talk about it on things mm -hmm. we're saying. Um, and that's kind of where I was leading when I got disconnected again about that's what cre you have to avoid that. Don't use the same passage every time you talk about something. Um, even if the, uh, may not be true proof texting of misapplying a passage, but it can almost be a personal proof texting that every time you talk about something, they know you're going to go to that passage. Um, yeah. And I think to, to avoid that. Um, so I want to get that in real quickly. As to the zeal um, and the things that we said that were just sometimes downright mean, I probably will tell you that I probably was on the receiving end more on the giving end of that because I was so highly aware of that when we started preaching that was probably more common than it is now um yeah. and and let me say this to guys as nicely as i can if you change that behavior that does not make you soft or weak um yeah it, it could but it does not necessarily it may just make you wise and yes. that's really what we're talking about here is using wisdom in how you say things. Um, you know, when I was, I use an example about thinking about your words. When I was training with Wilson Adams, I talked about a story. It was, you said not to use life experiences. I was 22 at the time, <laughs> I think. I used, I used a life experience story. And um, I was talking about me and my sister, and I talked about how she was more of an emo kind of person and I was a jock kind of person and I thought nothing of that and I got pulled aside later on privately by Wilson and said don't say jock that older people think of an athletic supporter and I was like you got to be kidding me right and I never forgot that another one of those things was I mentioned a movie one time in my internship it was a rated R and I was told don't ever call a movie by name if you use it as an example that's rated R because if people know you lose them on and, and, and yeah. some of that is some of that is not that those illustrations were bad, but how I said them were bad, and that I disconnected with my audience because of how I said them. So part of what we're talking about is really filtering through things and thinking about how you say something. Um, you know, quite frankly, there's some times I think people think that maybe I don't think through things, and I really am thinking through them. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, jury's still out on that. <laughs> yeah. It's, and, and it is as polished as it can be because, and I will say that sometimes I'm more direct than some other guys because they're also, we don't need to over polish so much that people don't understand what we're saying. And I think that's the other danger of this is sometimes guys go so far that they beat around the bush and you kind of leave that sermon going, well, I don't really know what he meant here. Um, and so I, it's this fine balance of knowing what he meant and doing it as a non-offensive way as possible. Um, so as to the personal illustrations and the preacher illustrations, I will I, I offer this one thing. This is one of the reasons you read more and not just mm -hmm. academically, that's great for study and not just even spiritual books. Um, and I would say even our society, not even read more. This is why you have a healthy broad uh, podcast list or other sources of information. You know, one of my favorite podcasts right now is Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History. I'm kind of late to the show. Um, I've listened to a lot of the past episodes. Some of them, by the way, have explicit language. I want to throw that out there. Do not condone that. But there's a lot of things you learn from some of those kind of things that are just, they're not even religious, um, that you actually can use as illustrations that aren't your traditional pre preacher illustrations of 
the same illustration that the guys heard 15 preachers use. Um, and so what I'm saying is you just need to expose yourself to a lot of different things. Um, yeah. Be as cultured as possible, and that will help you to approach people. I think part of the point of being polished is that idea that Paul had where he said to the Jews he was a Jew, to the Greek he was a Greek. I mean, it, in that sense, you have to preach in a way that, it, that attracts yourself to a lot of different crowds. I'm a sports guy. I used to use to me sports analogies, and somebody pointed that out to me years ago. Why do you always talk about sports? And so I had to – I still talk about sports a lot. done that today. But I have to also talk about other stuff um, and incorporate other things. And that's all part of Polish. You know, uh, on that same, you can think about it this way. I, I listen to Seth Godin's Akimbo. He's a, a marketer, and he always has great illustrations to back up the research that he's done. Um, but you really want to get to a point where you're comfortable in all places. You, you should be comfortable in the opera house. You should be comfortable out in the woods because your brethren are in both of those places emotionally and spiritually. It doesn't mean literally you're at the opera house and literally you're in the woods. But you've got to figure out a way to kind of move into those head spaces and those perspectives to connect with them. Um, and, yeah, those word choices, those methodologies of don't say this, say that, um, that's going to always change. That language will change in the, in the future, too. And you've got to be ready to adapt to that when it comes um, so that your end product is a changed heart. Um, and I'll concur with Terry, you know, adapting – the way in which you speak to be the most effective does not make you weak. There are times when you need to be forceful. And direct is forceful. But direct in the right pressure point produces relief, not suffering. Um, so you're pushing on the right things. Wisdom comes across in that regard. And Terry and I, for both of us, I think we, we would reflect and say in our 20s, we were not wise. That's a shocker. Um, uh, sometimes in my 40s, I'll speak for myself, I regret the method that I did something when I could have done it a better way. And our goal with this podcast, at least kind of conversations, is to seek the better way, do the work in the most effective way. Uh, and I'll hint at this. Terry and I are intending to use this conversation to talk about some reflections on the way in which brethren have interacted with each other over the years over important doctrinal issues, important social issues, important spiritual issues. Uh, and so eventually we're going to peel the layers off of everything because it's a necessary conversation. We may not change the generation ahead of us. We may not change our own generation, but we certainly have an obligation to those who follow behind us to do the best we can to help them be better than we were. That's part of my perspective to it. Yeah, and when that happens, um, I guess we could say this. There'll be part of that conversation that will probably be raw and um, brutally honest at times, I would imagine. We've not figured all that out. Um, so that's just where we're headed eventually, and that, that won't be next week. Um, the other, Let me give a positive kind of maybe tip to go on for the preacher listening about how he can polish his sermon in such a way to affect his entire audience. You know, um, one of the great speaking, public speaking and speech writing tools that you learn in Toastmasters and other communication classes, it's what's called triads, which is you say things three ways, the same thing. Um, I use D. Bowman as an example that D. Bowman was famous for triads. People didn't even notice it, except for they knew he used really big words you never knew. But what D. always did was he, he introduced the concept of the word, he used the word, and then he closed with the third leg of that triad as another definition or understanding of the word. And so while you never knew these words before you heard D. speak, you were never confused as to what the message was because it was always sandwiched in the middle of this triad or this three-pronged kind of statement. So when you use, when you think about preaching and you use triads, one of the things I try to teach the guys I've worked with is triads are fantastic. And especially when you start really using triads, and I don't know if you use them a lot, Bill, but I almost start talking in triads when I'm in an internship because I emphasize them so much. I'll start saying everything to them in three ways. Um, but when you do that, and this is why I write my sermons out. For those who don't know, I write out every word. It is not a ad lib. I am purposeful 
And this is one of those reasons is I purposely designed those triads to address usually three different parts of my audience. It, it may be that I say something that is gender based to men and then women and then in with a third triad that's for everybody. It, it may be that I speak to kids, to parents, and then everybody. It may be that it's non-Christians, Christians, and then everybody. There's a lot of ways to do that, but you can use those triads to address what you're saying to specific targets in your audience, more than one, and also be adding a lot of depth of explanation to what you're saying in the process. And so if you sit down this week to write your sermon, I encourage you to start using triads. If you want to learn how to do that, you can reach out to me or Phil. Um, but as you do that, if you're already doing it, I want you to think about using that in a way that gives you more polish and depth of who you're talking to so that everybody that leaves thinks you talk to them somehow, some way, um, and you don't leave any of that out. Yeah, here's the balance. Um, the secret of Phil's sermons that they sound uh, more conversational, my entire conversation with you is scripted. Um, I've got yeah. notes. I don't have a full um, paragraph by paragraph, but my outlines actually have the bulk of what I want to say. Uh, because yeah. I am a forgetful human being, and I want to say it a certain way. There are certain key phrases and statements that I want to make sure that as I go through the sermon, I say them a certain way, because it will hit the points that matter the most. Uh, we've been a little longer than I planned, a little longer than Terry planned. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that, but um, we want to appreciate everyone taking the time to listen to us today. I want to encourage you to Continue to grow the base of your understanding of God, the base of your understanding of his word. And as you're doing the work of an evangelist, of a teacher, remember that you're not alone in the journey. Uh, there are many men who you'll never meet, who may never meet you, uh, that are doing the same task and they have the same struggles. Um, you need to know that you're not alone. Uh, and uh, if you need help, uh, we want to help. Uh, if we can encourage you in some way, let us know if you've got questions, drop them in the box, and we'll be happy to incorporate them, either private conversations or public ones. You know, we do that. A lot of the conversations that we get sent to us, we deal with privately because that's the better context. Um, Terry, any shout outs before we close out the uh, uh, time today? Just what you just said, just to echo that, just a reminder, we're all on the same team. We're all serving the same God, and we're all part of the same kingdom. And if we can help you in any way serve God and grow that kingdom, please let us. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful day. All right. Bye-bye.